I'm Chris Turner, and this is the Empowered Parent Podcast. Greetings, listeners, and welcome to another episode of the Empowered Parent Podcast. Joining me once again are Ryan and Kayla North. Hi, guys. Hey, Chris. Christopher. And we have a special guest this evening joining us via the miracle of the internet, Jane Schooler. Hi, Jane. Hi, Chris. Hey, Jane. So good to hear your voice, Jane. How are you? I'm doing well and good to be talking to the both of you. Yeah. We're so glad you could join us for this. We're super excited about conference. Yeah, well, thank you. So Jane is not only our keynote speaker on Saturday, but she and David are going to be doing a workshop on Friday, questions to consider about self-care. And so Jane, we wanted to have you on to kind of maybe talk about that a little more in depth to give our listeners an idea of what the workshop might be like. Well, you know, when we are going to be talking on Friday, we're going to explore really what we talk about self-care, but it's not the typical thing that you, uh, when you think about self-care, when I ask, like Kayla, when I ask you about self-care, what comes to your mind? Um, Yoga, drinking lots of water, you know, spending quiet time away from my children. That's kind of my first thing. (laughs) Water with cucumbers in it. Water with cucumbers would be great. Going to a spa, right? I mean, I think that's what I think of. I don't know about cucumbers, but uh, we recently did this topic at a conference for social workers, and I had a woman come up to me and say, if you at, tell me to take a bath and take a walk, I'm not going <laughs> to Yes. So when we jump into this topic, I do not believe that we can really take care of ourselves unless we're taking care of our soul. Yeah. And that is the emotional part of who we are. So we're going to be exploring a lot of ways by asking good questions, what that means. I love that. I love that. Just going beyond what, you know, we normally think about, because there's so many blog posts and people that talk about self-care and just taking care of yourself, but just to go a little deeper. I love that because I mean, we're spending a whole day on it, so we have to go deeper, obviously, but I love that idea. Can you give us like a little maybe um, tidbit of something that you're going to talk about? Well, no, we're going to start out a, right from the very beginning, laying the foundation. Oftentimes we think self-care is selfish. And mm, yeah. we're going to be sharing a quote by a gentleman by the name of Parker Palmer. Self-care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship of the only gift I have, the gift I was put on earth to offer others. So right from the very, very beginning, we're going to talk about the fact that self-care and soul care is not selfish. Yeah. Oftentimes we, you know, people say, I can't, you know, I can't do self-care because I I need to take care of my kids. I I feel selfish and guilty when I do it. So we're going to be looking at what hinders our ability to take um, care of ourselves is one question we're going to explore. Oh, that's good. Yeah, because I think we, I know as a mom, I will often just say, well, I've got to take care of everybody else. And then I have no time to take care of me at all. Right? Because I'm, I'm meeting all of their other needs. But then I find the more that I am doing that and not taking care of myself, the more drained I am, the more I yell at my kids, the more I you yell at our kids. Yeah, from time to time no. I do. <laughs> Just when you're not home. Do you yell at Ryan? <laughs> I, do, I do from time to time. That's true. She you does know. yell at me. <laughs> when we are constantly working, and we're going to talk about margin, but when we're constantly pushing outside of what should be our margin, eventually it's going to catch up with us physically, emotionally, yeah. relationally, in absolutely yeah. every way. Absolutely. Well, I think part of the problem, though, though too, is, is we live in, in, in a culture of, more, 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 more. If it, if this is going to succeed, it's going to be by my power and my hand and my will and my might. And, 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 and most of us, um, and if I'm honest, I'll, I'll own it. I sometimes feel like my cluttered up calendar is, is almost like a badge of honor. Cause mm. we think if we're just doing yeah. more, we're important and we're making a difference and all those kinds of things. But um, it's to the point now where I actually will will schedule things on my calendar and get reminders to to do things that are non typical engagement with people. 
some of that stuff becomes our identity and it's very important to us. So we keep driving to fulfill the, that identity need when it, it has great cause for us. Another question to look at um, is, and I think this is so critical, and that how does our biography, my own story, how I grew up and the things that happened for me and the things that didn't happen for me influence my physical and emotional health. And so we're going to dive deep into that. That's really good. It's funny, that topic is not one that people really love to talk about until they do. And then I think they, they see the importance of it. You know, I think sometimes people are a little scared to, to go back cause they're wanting to move forward. And, uh, so I think that we sometimes get a little scared of talking about our own history, but it's funny that, that that has come up because we've had several people, um, wanting to talk about, looking at their own history as part of tapestry conference, like several speakers for breakout sessions have wanted to kind of dive into that topic. Cause I think for those of us that are leading, we're kind of getting to that place where we're realizing how important that piece is. It's a foundation of how well we're going to do ultimately over time. And if I understand what I'm bringing to this, it's about self-awareness. This whole workshop is going to be about self-awareness and God awareness. And those are the two foundational principles that we have to look at. Sometimes it's painful to go there, but it's absolutely necessary if we're going to be free to do what God has for us to be. That's so good. So um, here, here's a thought why um, I think that a lot of uh, adoptive and foster parents particularly uh, might miss, um, because I think a lot of us uh, get involved in this work because we want to make a difference and feel like there's a lot to do and we cannot take a minute because we were never raised to think that it's okay to take a pit stop and get some refreshment and recharge so that you are able to better meet the needs of your children. Um, so we kind of miss that a little bit, but also this idea of, uh, of secondary trauma, right? So if we are truly embracing our kids' histories and truly um, just, just intertwining our lives with theirs that we do, uh, take on their burdens and their burdens do become our own. And I think that we're not aware of that. I think that we, um, we choose to ignore that if we are aware of that. Um, we went down to Houston last year and spoke to a group. Uh, there was a dinner for CPS workers down in Houston and spoke to them about this concept of secondary trauma. And uh, when I was done, a lot of people came up to me afterwards and said the same thing, man, we are so glad that somebody gets it. Because she said, no, they all said, nobody talks about um, the burdens that we bear. I and mean, you look at case, uh, case managers from, um, from Child Protective Services here in Texas, I think the turnover rate was like 38% or something recently. So, you know, four out of every 10 quit every year just from burnout. So, yeah, I mean, I think that this idea of taking care of yourself is important. But I do love how you elevated that we're not taking care of ourselves in a humanistic earthly sense but we're taking care of our souls because they're, they're, we are spiritual beings and there is an added co component that needs to be added in to the t you know pedicure and coconut water or whatever <laughs> pedicure and coconut water that's what you just said about burnout you know more and more places all the time are instituting what we call debriefing, maybe a crisis debriefing or weekly debriefing as a, as a staff. But foster and adoptive parents have things happen in their home. And very often they have nobody to debrief what has happened. And it can be extremely, extremely traumatic for them. And if they don't process that trauma, we know what research tells us. If you have a traumatic event in your family or home, if you don't talk about that within 72 hours, it goes, becomes part of your emotional circuitry. And we've got parents stuffing down weeks, months, or even years of traumatic stuff going on in their home, and they've never debriefed it with anybody. Yeah, And that's Gosh. all a part of when we talk about taking care of ourselves is that we have those significant people that we can process what's happened to us in our homes with some of our kids and their behavior. Really critical. I think you said something critical there in that we need to have these other people because the truth of the matter is that, that healing relationships 
don't happen in isolation, right? So you cannot care for yourself or your soul by yourself. You need oh, you, you need empathetic listeners. You need um, you need people who are in 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 the um, the lifeboat with you, so to speak. You know, years ago, uh, we were part of a small group at our church, and at Christopher Turner's uh, suggestion, he said, "Why don't we start a group that's just with adoptive and foster families?" Uh, from the church. So we did because everybody's kind of in that boat together and everybody gets each other. Um, and it's just been, just been really, really great because, you know, um, Kayla can probably talk about this a little bit more because I think she's sharing this at, at a retreat she's speaking at this weekend about how we were meant to bear each other's burdens, right? We carry our loads, but we bear each other's burdens. And so our pastor recently said in a sermon that this idea that God won't give you more than you can, than you can handle is not actually biblical because God does give you more than you can handle for two reasons. One, so you will rely on him and two, so that you will rely on others because we were made for community, right? I mean, Genesis two, then the Lord said it was not good that man was alone. So we do need to seek and find those communities. And I think that's a really super, super important part of the self care, soul care things that you're talking about. And Christian adoptive parents, I found it's very difficult sometimes for us to ask for help because we, you know, we believe God has called us to do this. And I don't want to let anybody know I'm failing the mission. Mm, yeah. And I, that, that's why these groups where people can be truly vulnerable with each other are so critically important. I think adoptive and foster parents really can finish each other's own sentences. Hmm. We all know what, what are, we're feeling and thinking. We get this. Yeah. Jane, you and David have you know, worked and taught all over the world. Do you think that that's something unique more to Western Christianity, or is that something you see everywhere? That's a good question. Um, I would say even in other cultures, they're even less likely hmm. to reach out for help. A lot of the cultures that we've trained, especially in Central Asia and, and um, Eastern Europe, you you bear your own burden. That you're stoic. You don't tell people you you're hurting or suffering. Yeah. And uh, even in the church, they don't. They don't know how to go to the emotional piece so mm. often. They don't go there because they decades and decades of not allowing any kind of emotional thing at all. So when we go in talking about this stuff. It is a whole brand new world for them. So in other places, it's even less likely to reach out for help. Mm. Wow. Well, and sadly, one of those places where it's less likely to reach out for help is the country we live in. Because we still, it's still crazy to me that in 2018, there, is all the, there are all these negative stigmas surrounding therapy, right? I mean, people go to therapy and go to counseling and they don't share it because... Other people will think I'm flawed. Other people will think I'm weak. Other mm-hmm. people will think there's something something wrong with me, right? And so, I mean, we've been victims of that over the years. Kayla and I went and saw a marriage counselor, and my parents watched our kids, and all we told them was, quote, we had an appointment. <laughs> they probably right. figured it out. They might have, yeah. <laughs> because honestly, I didn't, I didn't want to hear it. We are, we're really good at giving in some ways, but we're not really good about receiving for ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's hard. It's yeah. very hard. And I think men are worse. Don't you, Kayla? Uh, I do. I do. I think women. <laughs> <laughs> That's a total stereotype. Yeah, it Jane, were you, were you specific about how men are worse, or was that just a general statement that men are just worse? <laughs> They're just worse. No. <laughs> We'd no. like to admire your courage for being honest about that. No, just for asking for help and admitting they need things. Men, a lot of men don't even ask for directions. Of course, you don't need any more. You got GPS. Exactly. Though, to be fair, some of us are born with an innate sense of direction. Thank you. I was just about to say that. (laughs) I can just find Uh, stuff. That's right. (laughs) You just find it. I have no problem asking for directions or for help. But yeah, no, I do find that especially... Um, especially when it comes to something hard that you've chosen to do, like you've chosen to be a foster parent or you've chosen to adopt a child. I think we find a lot of shame associated with, like you said, with, with asking for help because we feel like God has called us to do that. We should be able to do it. But I don't think God calls you to do things alone. I think that, you know, your community wraps around you and that's the whole reason that you can do it is because not everybody's called to adopt, not everybody's called to foster, but everybody can do something, can support those families that are doing it. Well, I think 
you know, there have been another number of studies of um, particularly adoptive moms, not so much the studies have been about adoptive dads, but about adoptive moms. And they report high levels of isolation. Yeah. Um, that is really critical. That's why uh, the groups that you're creating and groups you're supporting are so important. A friend of mine did his doctoral thesis on the uh, what makes uh, what contributes to the resiliency of adoptive families. The bottom line was that they were part of a community. Yeah. Yep. And that that was their number one resilient factor, that they had an attachment. They were connected to people who understood. And that's why that is so important. Well, I was, um, I was reading Born for Love, the Bruce Perry book recently, and they talk about how divorce has a, a less harmful impact in, in Iceland was the place where they did the study because it's such a, a communal culture that, that these kids are born into families that, that have multiple you know circles around them. And so when the nuclear family breaks up, it's less devastating to them because they're part of that communal thing where over here in the West and in the United States, we tend to sort of really elevate the nuclear family above, above all else. And mm -hmm. so when something happens in the nuclear family, it's devastating to everybody in it because we tend to want to live in isolation because it's not just, I think you and Kayla are absolutely right. I agree with you that it, people have this idea that, well, if God called me to this, then why am I not able to just, you know, hit the ball out the park? The flip of that though, is for a lot of people uh, in our experience and working with others that when they shared that they were going to adopt or foster, there wasn't an overwhelming level of support from their family and their friends. There are more sort of questions, there are more sort of doubts. And the reason that a lot of us tend to suffer in, in silence and isolation is because we don't want to hear those words that are the worst in all of English. I told you so. Oh, I know. And you know, I think one of the reasons we have that, that you know, that you get that negative thing from family and friends is they are questioning, what do you expect me to, what role do you expect me to have in this child's life? And I'm not sure I'm able to do that. Yeah. And so I'm not going to really support you in this because I don't know if I can do what you need. Yep. yep. And that's I true. think that's a, a big part of it, for sure. One of the things that I've always thought, especially as, you know, my own kids have gotten older and we've had, and we've had more and more struggles, is that I wish there was a way that you could let a prospective adoptive or foster parent kind of into your mind and see your day and what you deal with. Because I think a lot of us, especially with that first kid that we bring home, we have no idea how hard it really is. And like Ryan was was saying earlier, we, we don't want to ask for help because, you know, well, this is what I'm supposed to do, but we really don't know what it is we're supposed to do because we, we just have no, no concept of it. I think yeah. that, that there's, a, um, there's a growing trend in child placing agencies here in Texas that um, if you're signing up for any, if you're licensed for any level above basic, that you're, there's an on-the-job training requirement and you have to do respite for, for kids who are leveled up. That's a good idea. So you can at least have some, I mean, you're not going to see everything, right? But, but you do have some idea of it's, uh, it's a life fired role. Uh, caring for traumatized children. Right. You know, you can never train anybody on how something is going to feel. Mm. Yeah, that's good. No. And I think what happens is foster and adoptive parents are broadsided by their emotional stuff that hits them in the face. They didn't, they didn't expect to get so angry. They didn't expect to be so frustrated. They thought they would do better than that. And so they're broadsided by the, what they perceive as their own emotional inability to manage this and um that is again you can tell parents in, in pre-service but not it's not till they are journeying it that they really get it and understand that yeah because we've had lots of parents go you know i had three biological kids we brought home this child i was so excited we were all ready we thought we were prepared and then i didn't recognize myself anymore because mm. I was screaming at this child and I wouldn't get frustrated with the other kids and I'd never been a screamer before but now all of a sudden I was screaming and I was yelling and I was frustrated all the time and I felt tired and and all these emotions and feelings that they had never experienced before even as a parent were flooding them because I don't think they ever expected it to be so hard and they I mean parenting in general is hard but they weren't 
expecting that level of hard that they got. Yeah. 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 And that's why these support groups are so important that people are talking the same language. They're in community together that understand and don't judge. Yeah, absolutely. And part of self care is the, having that ability to reach out and say, listen, I'm having a bad day. I need, I need to talk to somebody. Yeah. Um, or, or being intentional about other people in your life that you reach out to them. Yeah. Um, it's all part of, of self care. Yeah. Cause if, um, if you can make a list of five people, who you're in relationship with on a level that they know who you are. Um, and this isn't my original idea that actually showed this in church the other day. Then, then you got some real problems that you need to fix in your life because you cannot do it alone. And he said, write down five people that you spend in time in relationship with and you can't write your spouse's name down. And that's hard for people to do because we're increasingly isolated. We want to be left alone. We fake intimacy by looking at pictures on Facebook which, which compounds the problem, right? Because from a, from a brain development standpoint, you can't develop empathy unless you actually have real relationships with real people. Mm. And if you don't develop empathy, then you want fewer, you know what I'm saying? It's just a, a self-perpetuating downward spiral. Yeah. In our training curriculum um, with Back to Back, we have, and, and Kayla has seen it, it's the circle of support. And yeah. families identify who's going to be the rock in their life, the wise person, the learner, the advocate and the helping hand. And so for some families that is really difficult because you can only put a family member in one of those circles mm. and the rest have to be outside your family. Mm. And I have sh- social workers do it just to get them to know how hard that is. And they can't find five people to fill up their circle of support. So yeah. it's a really critical need to build that community. Yeah. No, it really is. And and I think it's, you know, we thought we had that in place when we started. And then we quickly realized that we didn't, not because our family and friends didn't care about us, but they just didn't know how to care for us. Like they just didn't understand. And so it only took a few times of telling some friends like the struggles or the frustrations with, a, you know, a new placement or a child that was going through something and just being trying to find a listening ear and them going, Oh yeah, my kid throws tantrums too. You just need to punish them more. And me going, no, that's not going to work. This is different. And realizing I had to change who my circle of support was not that I had to like, say you can't be my friend anymore. They just weren't the go-to person for certain things because they just didn't understand. So I had to kind of uh, find a different group. Dave and I were just at an amazing conference this last week in Little Rock, and they call it the Village. And it was designed to have foster and adoptive families bring their relatives and friends and teachers of their kids and people who were in contact with their kids to this conference to learn about the kids. And it was highly successful. And I love the concept. Is we got to educate the village. That's that around is really foster. cool. Is it something they do every year? Or is this no, like a this new thing? The first thing, time they time? Brand new. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. We did something similar for Tapestry Conference a few years ago. We tried to kind of encourage people to bring their parents and their teachers. And we had some that did it. But um, Ryan and I actually had a bet who could get our, our parents to come to it. And he, won, <laughs> he won that bet. We weren't allowed to tell our parents we had a bet. <laughs> I don't make bets that I... I'm not sure I'm not going to win. Yeah. If, if we had been able to tell our parents that we had a bet, then I would have gotten both of my parents there because they would have wanted me to win the bet. But no, they sure. would have wanted me to lose the bet. Just <laughs> put the cookies on the curb yeah, itself. Yeah, they wanted you to lose. So, but well, he, he won. Kind of the grandparents are needed to babysit. But, exactly. Uh, they provide child care. They had uh, over 110 kids in child care. That's uh, awesome. Conference day. Yeah. So that's really cool. Again, all this is all part of self care. And I haven't it shared is. everything we're going to talk about on Friday because that, that's kind of a secret till we get there. Yeah. But um, I think people are going to be going, find themselves going deeper than maybe what they actually expected. When we come to a conference, it's not about taking a bath or taking a walk. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love it. I'm excited. Me too. Awesome. And we're excited to come. Well, Jane, I know I'm really looking forward to to sitting through the workshop, and we hope that this has been uh, an insight into what they can expect for our listeners who are going to attend the conference. 
So thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ryan and Kayla, thank you once again for being on. Thanks, Chris. Delightful as always, Christopher. If you've heard something from Jane and that you have some questions about and you'd like to email them to us, feel free to send it to info at onebighappyhome.com. If you can squeeze it into 280 characters, feel free to tweet it to us at One Big Happy Home. We also have a Facebook group just for podcast listeners. Search for the Empowered Parent Podcast Community, and you can post a question there as well. You can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, the Google Play Store, and Spotify. Just search for the Empowered Parent Podcast. If you've enjoyed and gotten value from our show, we would appreciate a review in any of these locations. The Empowered Parent Podcast is committed to helping parents of foster and adopted kids through connecting, correcting, and empowering principles. Thanks for listening. 